I have the pleasure of introducing uh, this particular panel. I'm so excited. Uh, we're co-sponsoring this with Harvard, Harvard's Memorial Church uh, and uh, uh, their extraordinary leader, Jonathan Walton. So I just want to bring uh, Professor Walton, who's uh, the uh, uh, plumber professor of Christian morals and Pusey minister in Memorial Church, uh, to the stage to uh, introduce uh, Governor Patrick. And what I would love to say about uh, Professor Walton is that he has exhibited uh, a kind of incisive, insightful uh, 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 leadership of Memorial Church uh, and a courageous and prophetic voice uh, for not only Harvard but for the country. Um, and I think it's only appropriate that he would introduce Governor Patrick. Good evening. Much has been made of Governor Duval Patrick's miraculous rise. Who doesn't like a feel good story? From housing projects to Harvard, from Chicago's quote unquote violent South Side to the historic Massachusetts State House. His account inspires. His story instills hope. His testimony, no doubt, represents the best of this nation's professed ideals. But to quote James Baldwin, American history is longer, larger, more beautiful, and more terrible than anything anyone has ever said about it. Similar might be said of Deval Patrick's life. Rags to riches tales often obscure more than they elucidate. Developmental models of human progress tend to conceal the activity of many in order to convey the seemingly Herculean feats of a few. This is why nobody tells Governor Patrick's story better than he does. For in his version, nobody saved him from social chaos, nor did anyone deliver him from the darkness of urban America into a wonderful light of Milton Academy in Massachusetts. To the contrary, Deval Patrick traces his love of learning to Terrell Elementary School in Chicago. Here, his third grade teacher, Mrs. Streets, instilled in her students intellectual curiosity and personal ambition. It was Mrs. Quaintus, his sixth grade teacher, who took her students on field trips to the Chicago Lyric Opera. And it was Mrs. Weisenberg who encouraged students like Duvall to pursue programs such as A Better Chance so that they might have more educational options than their community unfortunately provided. And this, this understanding of beauty and tragedy all bound together explains his moral commitments. For example, his commitment to public education. For it was during his eight years in office, rather than lean on the quality of the overall performance of the state, a state that ranked during his tenure number one in public education, Governor Patrick pursued new ways to close the achievement gaps among those who are browner and poorer. He worked to provide more resources to teachers who were forced to make bricks out of straw. Consider on King Day 2010 when he signed the Achievement Gap Act. And it was this bill that established innovation schools throughout the states which provided resources and flexibility to educators in otherwise struggling areas rather than cast a broad net of blame over educators who, like so many of his elementary school teachers, did so much with so little. 
These innovations enabled educators to embrace creative pedagogies, elongate the school day, as well as enter into public-private partnerships. The state opened nearly 50 such schools before Governor Patrick left office. And in his words, investing in public education, pre-K through college, is our moral responsibility. It is what we owe one another. And here lies another feature of Governor Patrick's personality and leadership. For unlike many in his party, he's never shied away from the language of morality, nor has he sought to divorce this language from religious faith. For him, the two are inextricably connected and bind us together in a common fabric of mutuality. In 2014, for instance, the federal government requested that states help thousands of unaccompanied immigrant children who entered our country through the southern border. These were children fleeing unspeakable violence. Many of their parents preferred to risk sending their children away in the hopes of safety rather than keep them close to face certain death. State and local officials from both parties attempted to dissuade Governor Patrick, and the public outcry of protest was steady and boisterous. Yet in an official press conference, then Governor Patrick stood before the microphone and said these words. I believe one day we will all have to answer for our actions and our inactions. My faith teaches that if a stranger dwells with you in your land, you shall not mistreat him. For you were strangers once in the land of Egypt. And we are admonished to take in the stranger for as much as you did it to the least of these, Christ teaches us, you did it unto me. For every major faith tradition on the planet charges that we should treat others as we ought to be treated. And I don't know what good there is in faith, he said, if we can't and won't turn to it in times of human need. This good nation is great when we open our doors and our hearts to needy children and our nation is diminished when we do not. The importance of education, the power of faith, paideia and piety, two essential attributes of Deval Patrick's moral life. And these are just a few of the reasons that I believe it's appropriate for Governor Deval Patrick to address you, us, members of the American Academy of Religion and Society of Biblical Literature tonight. For our mission underscores the need to better understand the critical interlace of religious traditions and values and the central role that religion plays in social, economic, and political events. Deval Patrick is someone whose political career operates at this intersection. Thus, communities throughout this commonwealth and our country are better for it. My friends, please receive former Massachusetts Governor Deval L. Patrick. Mercy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reverend Professor Walton, for that generous introduction. I hope to become the man you described. Um, I, I wish we had compared notes before, uh, before the introduction, since you gave most of my speech. President Glaude, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, good evening to all of you, and welcome to Boston. I'm glad to be with you this evening, humbled and honored, in fact, but to be truthful, it's also a little weird. 
Governors don't often address religious scholars. We might do the odd commencement address here and there or maybe the occasional policy lecture, but not sermons, certainly nothing like that introduction. I was asked to speak tonight about the role of religion in many of the world's great challenges today. Wow. Somebody else advised me that I could say anything I wanted so long as I was brief. <laughs> I've decided to take the advice on brevity. Maybe not religious scholars, but church people are familiar to me. On the south side of Chicago in the 50s and 60s, where and when I grew up, church was a big part of our lives. My grandmother was the featured soprano in the Baptist church, in her Baptist church, until she had some sort of falling out with the preacher. After that, my sister and I were sent to the Cosmopolitan Community Church at the end of the block, bribed by the promise of a big country breakfast when we got home. Cosmopolitan was a quiet sanctuary, as black churches go, with a woman pastor, an uncommon thing in those days. Cosmopolitan had in common with all black churches the transformative power of music and the watchful presence of old ladies in hats who took the business of worship seriously. One of the many lessons I learned in that community of friends and family was, was about the importance of having a moral foundation. It was never about sanctimony or any sort of moral superiority, just a set of ethical expectations the community had of us, and most importantly, that we were supposed to have of ourselves. Those old ladies in hats used their moral guideposts in everyday life through old-fashioned notions that on the way to work on Monday, you don't leave your conscience at the church door. That faith is not just what you say you believe, but how you live. And how the best of them lived offered a moral example to the rest of us. It sounds a little too grand to say that in my time as governor, I tried to serve with faith as my moral rudder. I am no evangelist. I have not followed the example of one of my fellow governors who in the midst of a summer drought convened a press conference to pray publicly for rain. Even by my somewhat relaxed Presbyterian standards, I am an unfinished Christian. I am certainly an imperfect man. Where I grew up, faith was not a matter of showy piety, but rather of quiet acts of kindness and compassion. I tried to do my job and try to live my life as Micah teaches, by doing justly, loving mercy, and walk, walking humbly. Maybe it's simpler to say that I have tried to behave not so much as if God were watching, but as if the ones watching were those old ladies in hats from church. In my work as gover governor, that meant I tried to remember that there are human beings behind policy choices strivers and strugglers with aspirations and frustrations and anxieties. I tried to make policy matter where it touches people. Most of the people I met and served didn't want or expect government to solve every problem in their lives. They just wanted government to do its part to help them help themselves. A good school, a safe neighborhood, an expanding economy and the tools to ready themselves for it a decent road, safe bridges, convenient trains. When I hear the conventional political debates about charter schools and teachers unions, taxes and spending, regulation and free markets, it strikes me that liberals and conservatives alike have mastered their respective sound bites but perhaps lost sight of or even interest in the people at the ends of those choices. That mistake is easier to make than it ought to be Jobs like governor are a blend of substance and performance art, and more and more of what counts or at least gets noticed is the performance and less the substance. When I left office in 2015, I'm proud to say that Massachusetts was first in the nation in economic competitiveness, student achievement, healthcare coverage, energy efficiency, entrepreneurial activity, veteran services, and so much more. We had achieved a 20-year employment high and reformed more of state government than any administration in decades. Our budgets were sound, and our bond rating was the highest in Commonwealth history. And still, I wonder, 
in these days when image counts so much more and politicians allow themselves to live in a completely alternative universe, whether any of that substance actually matters. A Baptist bishop told me recently that when you're wondering such things, it's important to listen for God. He said that God answers questions like mine, but if you're not listening, you'll, you'll miss the answer. So I've been listening. In 2010, with the help of many grassroots advocates, our legislature passed a significant reform of our Cori system. This is the system that tracks every offender's criminal record. And it had become a practical barrier for many people with minor offenses who were trying to get back into productive life. So we took on the task of fixing it. When the bill was complete, we hosted a signing ceremony in a packed, unair conditioned un building in the Roxbury neighborhood of Boston on what felt like the hottest day in the history of time. <laughs> Hundreds of people came, and despite the heat and the crowd, excitement was high. In the midst of the joyful pandemonium after I signed the bill, a man handed me his cell phone and asked me to speak with his friend. The voice at the other end of the line thanked me for signing the bill. He said he knew it would make a difference in his life. I smiled and said I hope so, handed the phone back, and thought nothing more of it. Four years later, I arrived early for an event in Springfield, a city here in western Massachusetts. We decided to grab lunch at a restaurant down the block from the Basketball Hall of Fame downtown. The troopers and I were waiting for our takeout near the front of the restaurant when a man in chef's togs walked past. He stopped, he did a double take, that's a frequent reaction I get, at, which I attribute to being taller on television. <laughs> the man said, are you Governor Patrick? I said, yes. Then the man asked, do you remember signing the Cory reform? I said, yes, I, I do. He said, do you remember speaking to a guy on a cell phone right after you signed the bill that day? I said, as a matter of fact, I do. He said, I am that guy. I was sitting in prison when you took that call. When I got out, I got this job on account of Cory reform. He told me that today, that man is the executive chef of that restaurant. That policy, <laughs> that policy touched a person in real and intimate, personal ways. And I believe that matters. There are statistics to show our aggregate results and awards to recognize our body of work, but that day reminded me, as I have been reminded countless times before and since, that what matters more is beyond statistics and awards. It's the human souls behind the policy choices we make, the lives made a little better. There are families behind the affordable housing program, travelers, behind the bridge or road project, children who will only be children once, behind the line item for schools. Sure, we have to balance budgets, and we did that. But if we don't see the people behind the budget, the meek as well as the mighty, what's the point? Indeed, without that, what morality do we serve? Like other decent people, I've been hurting over the church shootings in Charleston and more recently in Texas. I've been in anguish over the shootings of children in schools and of black men in Ferguson and Staten Island and Chicago and all the places that haven't made the evening news. I've been wondering what these incidents say about the state of race relations in our country, about the state of humanity itself. What kind of people harbor such fear of someone like me that they shoot before asking questions? And what sort of people see what the rest of the world sees in the videotaped suffocating of a suspect and still hold no one accountable? What kind of person gets so worked up about the presence of peaceable black and white people that he shoots them dead while worship? And what kind of organization is the NRA to respond by saying the answer is to arm the preachers and everybody else? It's not just the physical violence we do to one another, but the civic violence that concerns me. What kind of people are we 
when the men and women we've sent to Washington respond to all of this, not by tackling the root causes of violence in our communities, but by building walls between us and taking health care from us and acting as if poverty was associated with fault. There has always been injustice. There have always been haters and bullies. But it seems to me that in the face of it, we have less moral leadership right now than we need. Even people of conscience today equivocate and parse. We credit the opinion that, me, that the massive resistant, resistance President Obama faced in Congress was just about policy differences when we know there's more to the story. President Trump notoriously chastised both neo-Nazis and the protesters for the violence in Charlottesville. And authorities charge both the driver who ran down the protester and the black man who was beaten, as if there was moral equivalency all around. Ambitious politicians, even here in supposedly progressive Massachusetts, demurred on flying the Confederate flag when the governor of South Carolina herself could, could no longer defend it. Everywhere, good people are becoming bystanders to injustice and unfairness. It's as if we've forgotten that positions of public trust in this country from the presidency on down are not simply administrative offices. They are, to paraphrase FDR, preeminently places of moral leadership. Moral leadership is to me about more than religiosity. In the secular world, it's about keeping our civic faith. It's occurred to me lately how much of our democracy depends on unwritten rules. Notions of restraint, integrity, respect, duty. Today we live in a reality TV culture where a lack of decorum is entertainment. And in a time when religion itself has again been weaponized around the world and even here in the United States to excuse or even justify all manner of ill will and ungodly behavior. Too many good people look the other way when our political allies act up and act out. You're seeing it even in these recent days as charges and countercharges fly back and forth. Demeaning and in some cases even dangerous behavior is made a partisan bludgeon. As an imperfect man and an unfinished Christian, perhaps my faith leads me more to humility than certainty. But partisanship is on the way to draining the ethics out of ethical standards. I can't help being perplexed and even a little confused by the self-described religious conservative. I can't understand how you square, square wealth worship with Christian worship. I can't understand how you square opposition to abortion with enthusiasm for the death penalty or how you can care so much about an unborn child and so little about a child living in poverty. I can't understand how you square that much intolerance with the humility of Christ. I wonder if Charles Blow got it right the other day when he wrote in the New York Times that being a religious conservative is more about branding than behavior. And then there are the Democrats. I'm a proud Democrat, not the kind that thinks you have to hate Republicans to be a good Democrat, but a proud Democrat nonetheless. But Democrats get on my last nerve. We have been cowed by the invocation of faith by our political opponents. As soon as conservatives start citing biblical strictures, we clam up and squirm uncomfortably. It's an odd thing because respect for the secular guarantees of our Constitution does not require us to yield the language and guidance of faith altogether. The gospel teaches, the gospel teaches that if we love Christ, we're supposed to feed his sheep. You might say, I'm a Democrat because I'm a Christian. Scripture teaches that faith demands action. 
Micah doesn't say to reflect on the abstract meaning of justice, mercy, and humility, but rather to do justice, love mercy, walk humbly. Action, not just consciousness, was central to the expectations of my old church ladies in hats. Reach out to people in their darkest hour. Help the poor struggling to keep their heads above water. Encourage those who have lost not just their way, but hope itself. Sure, we should debate what role government should play in meeting our moral obligations. But let us not forget in the heat of that debate that government is simply the name we give to the things we choose to do together. Somehow we are forgetting in, forgetting in and about government today that social justice is the point and that in local, state, or national community, social and economic justice is ultimately up to all of us and each of us. A country that reflects the kind of people we aspire to be is ultimately up to you and me. I am hopeful still. I believe we are not yet numb to the physical and civic violence on display all around us, all around the world. I believe, in fact, that there are many more big-hearted, generous people than there are bullies and haters. I believe we have not yet forgotten the people we were meant to be or the generational responsibility we have to leave the world better. But I do think we have to regain our voice. And I leave you with this story, a big part of which the Reverend Professor already told you. In 2014, as he mentioned, in my last full year in office, the Obama administration asked a number of states temporarily to shelter some of the refugee children stranded on our southern border. Now, you have to imagine this. Unaccompanied children, some as young as three and four years old, on their own, fleeing unspeakable violence over thousands of miles, seeking refuge here in the United States, and the federal authorities were overwhelmed. Now, feelings around immigration run hot, I get that, but to me, accepting the challenge to temporarily shelter these poor children was an act of both patriotism and faith. We are an extraordinary nation, an exceptional one even. Unlike any other superpower, America's power, to paraphrase a great man, comes from giving, not from taking. America, and Massachusetts in particular, has given sanctuary to dis desperate children for centuries. We have rescued Irish children from famine, Russian and Ukrainian children from religious persecution, Cambodian children from genocide, Haitian children from earthquakes, Sudanese children from civil war, and New Orleans children from Hurricane Katrina. Once in 1939, we turned our backs on Jewish children fleeing the Nazis, and it remains a blight on our national reputation. The point is that, as you heard, I believe this good nation is great when we open our doors and our hearts to needy children and diminished when we don't. There were those old ethical expectations in my decision too. Jews and Christians are indeed taught that if a stranger dwells with you in your land, you shall not mistreat him, but rather love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. In my faith tradition, we are admonished to take in the stranger, for inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, Christ tells us, you did it to me. Every major faith tradition on earth admonish us, admonishes us to treat others as we ourselves wish to be treated. And still I knew, still I knew our offer of shelter would be controversial. Indeed, for that decision on hate radio, I was called everything but a child of God. A couple of days after the announcement, on an unusual weekend morning without official appointments, my wife Diane gave me a list of stuff to get from the local Home Depot. It was early in the day and I thought I would just run out quickly on my own without bothering the state troopers in my security detail. That was something, by the way, they would rather not I do. But I knew exactly where I was going and where to find everything on my list. 
So I set off in the truck dressed in my T-shirt, my jeans and flip-flops, a baseball cap and dark glasses. It didn't matter. I was outed in the very first aisle by the manager. Good afternoon, Governor Patrick, or good morning, rather. Well, welcome to Home Depot. How can I help you? I encountered a man in the checkout line who was angry, not rude or threatening, just angry and loud. Governor, he said, I couldn't disagree with you more about your offer to shelter these children. He said, my own wife is an immigrant. She came here legally, and that's the way it ought to be. I want you to know that I think you are wrong. I thanked him for his feedback, and it was clear to everyone in the checkout line who was mad at whom and what he was mad about. I had six other encounters on the same subject in the store that morning. In each of the others, someone came up and whispered, Governor, I'm with you. Or, Governor, you're doing the right thing. Or, Governor, thank you for doing the right thing by those children. The calls to the office were three to one in favor of sheltering those children. It struck me how we've come to whisper kindness and shout our anger, and it's completely upside down. It's time we learned again to shout kindness, to shout justice, to shout compassion, to shout love. I don't see how we keep faith if we confine moral leadership to our Sabbath lessons and not admit it to our policy or indeed to our everyday lives. As the Reverend Professor said, I guess I just don't understand what good there is in faith if we can't and won't turn to it and let it speak to us in moments of human need. Every one of us faces moral choices, every one of us, as parents, as colleagues, as spouses, as citizens, as individuals. We face choices whether to show kindness, compassion, justice, even love. And because we are awash in them every day, we know all the arguments for choosing otherwise, that one must not seem soft or weak or compromising or irresponsible. But when we look for the human being behind our choice and reflect upon the ethical expectations we learn from our grandparents, our own clergy, our own church ladies and hats, I'm convinced we should choose kindness and mercy and love to shout it, in fact, because God knows the whole world needs us to do so. It's a blessing to be with you. Thank you for having me. We want to thank Governor Patrick. There's a slight break in between. We want to thank Governor Patrick. I think that message is absolutely consistent with the theme of this year's AAR, Religion and the Most Vulnerable. There's a break we have between this and the next event. Uh, so we want to thank Governor Patrick once again. Thank you so much.